the book of three. And as I said, we'll finish the book of three, book of three, I don't know, 30 or 45 minutes and get into the black cauldron today because we are supposed to be uh, finishing the black cauldron today or tomorrow or today or Tuesday. Uh, we're supposed to finish the black cauldron on Tuesday. Which we'll probably do. Okay, so where we left off. They are in the Hidden Valley. Yeah, they're in the Hidden Valley. It's about pages. Um, we just finished, if I remember right, talking about line uh, page 120, where Meduin tells Terran. Neither refuse to give help when it is needed, nor refuse to accept it when it is offered. Gwither, son of Grydal, learned that from a lame ant, you know. And then he goes on and tells this story. Where have we already seen in the story um, Terran offer help and have it accepted, or Terran refuse help when it is offered? Uh, he helped Gwydion when he thought Gurgi was going to attack him. Yeah, he, he thinks he's defending Gwydion when he hears the rustle in the thorn bush and just dump, jumps in after it. It turns out to be Gurgi. But then he also doesn't accept Gurgi's help. He doesn't, well, doesn't want Gurgi to come along. And um, this is partly why Meduin is saying this. Okay. He goes on and says, Meduin on 121, I've studied the race of men. I've seen that alone you stand as weak reeds by a lake. That is, individually trying to take on the problems of the world, so to speak. You stand as weak reeds by a lake. You must learn to help yourselves. That is true. That is, you, you have to learn self-reliance. Okay? but you must also learn to help one another. Why? What happens to an individual reed by a lake when either a big wave comes or a big wind comes, blows it right over? But you bind all those reeds together and they become firm, they become stiff. Are you not, all of you, lame ants because of the story that he's told? In other words, you get a bunch of lame ants, lame, one leg bad, you put them all together and what can they, they do? They can move mountains, so to speak. Okay, So we get to chapter the Black Lake. They leave the Hidden Valley, and page 124, Terran can't sleep. He's thinking of his problems, the greatest of which is, you know, I'm the cause for Gwydion being dead, or he thinks he is. And Meduin comes in and says, can't sleep? A restless night is no way to begin a journey. It's a journey I'm eager to end. There are times when I fear I shall not see Caradalbin again. And yet, what did he want at the beginning of the novel? To leave Caradalbin. To get out of there as fast as he could. It is not given to men to know the ends of their journeys, Meduin says. Okay? The ends of their journeys. I'll use my left hand. Because that word ends, has two meanings. It has the everyday ordinary one that we all understand, right? Like, um, what does the end of class mean? Or the end of a semester? You get to leave. It's over. It's finished. You get to leave. Okay? So it has this. Completion idea, okay? But end has another meaning. When you talk about something as being the means to an end, the end there isn't just its completion. It's also talking about something that starts at the beginning of something. It's what you have to have at the beginning. 
its purpose. So, for example, the end of this bottle is what? To contain liquid. That's its purpose. Okay? You can't say, well, what's the end of the bottle? Is it this? <laughs> or is it this? Well, it kind of depends on which way you're looking at it. If you're looking at it from this, then this is the part closest to me, so the end would be the part farthest away from me. Okay? So look at what Medellin said again. It is not given to men to know the ends of their journeys. Okay, journeys there, he's talking about life. He's not talking just solely about the specific journey that Tarrant is talking about. We don't know how we end up. We don't know where our life ends, where our journey takes us. Unless you're clairvoyant and you've been given, you know, a little booklet when you were born that says, this is your, you know, where you begin and where you end. It may be you will never return to the places dearest to you. Tara Dalbin is what he's talking about. But how can that matter if what you must do is here and now? In other words, Taryn's talking about, oh, there's no place like home. I just want to go home. All right? But Medwin's saying, what's most important is what? How do you get home? By completing your journey. By completing your journey. It's one way of looking at it. What's another way you get home? Even before you complete your journey. What must you do first to complete your journey? Start it. You have to take that first step. You have to leave. Wherever it is you are, wherever that journey begins, whether you're here at school and you're heading home or heading to work, or whether it's sucking that first breath of air as a baby, okay? you've got to take that first step. That's partly what he means there. But he also, when he says, and maybe you will never return to the places dearest to you, he might mean something different by that. Can you ever really go home? Or put it this way. You're 18 years old. You go off to war. You go to World War, you know, World war II. You go off to war. You storm the cliffs of Normandy. You march all the way through France. You don't get sent home. You've not earned enough points. And you're there for the entirety of the war. You see the horrors that are Nazi Germany. You free Buchenwald or Auschwitz. Do you think you can go back home five years later? Not the same. Either. And be the same? Not even home will be the same. So when he says, it may be you'll never return to the places dearest to you. Why? Because you can't go back to the beginning. You can't go back to your starting point. Things change, whether it is a short amount of time or a long amount of time. Okay? Why? Because the very journey itself, whatever that journey is, changes you. You change through the process of excuse me, through life, through living. Look what Terrence says. I think that if I knew I were not to see my own home again, I would be happy to stay in this valley. If I knew, 100% certainty and assurance, I would never see Kara Dalbin, I think I could be happy here. So, if he didn't have that assurance, he couldn't be happy? That's what he's saying. Why? Because there would always be the part of him who would say, oh, if only I could go back home. That's the whole grass is greener on the other side of the fence thing. I can never be happy here because what if? Okay, Alexander is kind of, through his characters and through their words, kind of gently trying to teach us some ideas. you got to learn to do what? Read into what he says. No. Well, I mean, yeah, to some extent, but it's not reading into it. You got to learn to be happy where? In the here and now. Where you are. 
where you are. Because some, you know, notwithstanding Renee, Renee Zellweger's famous line in, you know, um, Jerry Maguire, you complete me. Nobody, no person is going to, quote unquote, make you happy, make you fulfilled, make you complete. No job is going to do that. No car is going to do that. No stupid phone is going to do that. No computer is going to do that. No amount of money is going to do that. What is the only thing that can do that? Yourself. Yeah, look in the mirror. Okay? So, Medwin says, your heart is young and unformed. It's malleable. It's impressionable. Yet, if I read it well, you are of the few I would welcome here. In other words, you know, I don't welcome many people here, but you I would welcome. Is it because... His heart is unformed. He doesn't mean this thing. He means your, your being. Okay? Your soul, if you want. It's not cast in stone. You're not obstinate, <laughs> would be a good way of putting it. Indeed, you may stay if you choose. In other words, if you don't want to complete your journey, what is his journey, by the way? Remember? To get to uh, Gwydion's castle one. To get to Gwydion's castle, to the people of Dawn, and tell them, oh, by the way, Gwydion's dead. The Horn King's out and about, and Aran is trying to take over all Pernay against them. You know, a little thing. Surely you can entrust your task to your new friends. In other words, Ilanwi and Fluter can do it. Well, what did you think of Ilanwi? Silly girl. Can't leave anything important to her. And Fluter? What does he tend to do all the time? Why? Okay, you guys are mean. He exaggerates. <laughs> he massages the truth a little bit. Adds more you know? color to it. He adds color to it. He's a poet. You know, poets don't have to speak the truth. As one writer said, they breathe lies through silver. It's a nice way of putting it. It is a lie, but it's silver coated. So it looks really cool. Taryn, nope, I gotta go. Okay? He says, all right. I've taken it on myself through my own choice. I have chosen to do this. Medwin, well, then you can easily unchoose to do it, right? Has he completely acted on it yet? No. Nope. See, choices are wonderful things. Until you act on them, until you bring them from up here to out here, it doesn't really matter. You can up here decide to choose... To kill somebody doesn't matter until you actually do it. Until you pull the trigger, swing the sword, stab the knife, you haven't done it yet. It's once you do it, man, you can't take it back. All right? Now, Terrence says, my decision was made long before this. Okay. He says, I grant you all that you will allow me to grant. And Medwin puts him to sleep, okay? Essentially. I mean, they talk a little bit more, but... Okay, so they leave there, and they go on. Page 131. We're going to skip a bunch. 131. Medwin gave them directions. Okay? They, they seem to have gotten off the map. Because on 131, they're supposed to be going along the hill, the, the back of the mountain of the, the, what do I want? The spur of the hills. And 131, Ailan, we says, um, Medellin didn't say anything about crossing a valley or crossing valleys. Taryn, he didn't say anything about cliffs like these. They seem nothing to him. He's lived here a long time. But for us, you know, it's different. Ailan, we, if you don't listen to what somebody tells you, it's like putting your fingers in your ears and jumping down a well. In other words, if you don't listen to what somebody tells you, why listen to them at all? For an assistant pig keeper who's done very little traveling, you suddenly know all about it. So you're kind of going, uh, you sure this is the right way? So they climb down and they go into the valley. And what happens? 
They get sucked down a whirlpool. Yeah, they essentially get sucked down a whirlpool into Black, Black Lake, and they're captured by King Idleg. King Idleg, okay? And the little people. And I'm going to pick up. They're taken to King Idleg, and Taryn tells him, you know, what he's got to do. And page 140 and 141, they keep talking. And Taryn says, well, I, I know you're busy, so why don't you just let us go. Let us, 140, he says towards the bottom, let us disturb you no more. Get us, give us safe conduct to care Dathel. Okay? That's where Gwydion lived. He said, um, no, sorry, I can't do that. Impossible. Once you're with the fair folk, my good lad, you stay. Okay? This is an idea from medieval literature, from Middle English literature, from Celtic literature, from Irish and Scottish literature. If you get captured by the fairies or elves, you stay. We do have some accounts, stories, of people who were captured by them, and then they're released, and their lives are never quite the same. They're always, you know, just life doesn't mean as much. Okay? Tarek says, but we have to go. Our task is urgent. Well, it's your problem, not mine. Page 141. Taryn, uh, excuse me, Idaleg says, when Taryn says what's about to happen, this is a conflict you great gawks must attend to yourselves. The fair folk owe you no allegiance. Prudane belonged to us before the race of men came. You drove us underground. In other words, the reason we live in caves is because of you people. You plundered our mines, you blundering clod poles, you stole our treasures, and you keep on stealing them. You Notice you clumsy oaths. Every time he refers to men, what does he do? Or humanity. Yeah, there's an insult. Terrence, sire, I can speak for no man but myself. In other words, don't blame me for all of humanity. And that's a little lesson I think Alexander wants to get across. Don't blame an individual for what a group has done. Or don't blame an individual for what an ancestor has done. I've never robbed you. Okay, humans in the past might have. I never robbed you. I have no wish to. This is bottom of 141. My task means more to me than your treasures. If there is ill will between the fair folk and the race of men, then it's a matter to be settled between them. Okay? Not between you and me. If the horned king triumphs, if the shadow of Anuvan falls on the land above you, Aran's hand will reach your deepest caverns. Adelaide, you're not so stupid for an assistant pig keeper. It's essentially what he says. When he says, for an assistant pig keeper, you're reasoning eloquent. But the fair folk will worry about Iran when the time comes. Taryn, it has come. It has come. I only hope it hasn't passed. Arlan says, um, I don't think you know what's going on above ground. You talk about charm and beauty and sacrificing yourself to make things pleasant for people. I don't believe you care for that a bit. Okay? And then he discovers Henwin is there. Because Gurgi tells them. Chapter 16, Dolly. You said nothing of Henwin, Taryn says to King Adeleg. You didn't ask. Okay. Adeleg 145 says the fair folk rescued her. And there's another fine example. Do I get a word of thanks? Have you said thank you for rescuing my pig? Have you said thank you for preserving this oracular wonder? No. Terence says, um, no, there wasn't. There wasn't any mention of a pig at all. But there is a question of honesty and honor. Idleg. Honor. Hmm, yeah, I was afraid you'd come to that. True, the fair folk never break their word. Well, that's the price for being open-hearted generous. Okay, you can have your pick. We need weapons, too. 
So what's Tara now doing? Bargaining. Bargaining, negotiating. Doesn't do us any good to save the pig if we don't have any weapons to help protect the pig. Okay, you get weapons. Gurgi and munchings and crunchings. In other words, food, supplies. He says, man, you guys are going to ruin me out of house and home. And a guide. That's the last thing. We need a guide. So, Adeleg tells us, top of 146, you get Dolly. Off with you now before I change my mind. Okay, what kind of person is Dolly? A very grumpy dwarf. A grumpy dwarf. Yeah, that's a way of putting it. Does he ever see the glass as half full? No. Nope. It's always half empty. Everything's pessimistic. To Dolly, okay? So, page 150, they've left, and we know Dolly can make himself invisible. Somewhat. Yeah, somewhat. Well, actually, he can very well. At 150, Taryn says, because Dolly talks about, you know, being able to carve and make stuff, Terrence says, if I could carve gems and do all those other things, I wouldn't mind not being invisible. All I know is vegetables and horseshoes, and not too much about either. Now notice what he says there. I don't know anything useful, essentially is what he's saying. You know, if I could make things out of gems, if I could make joy, I, I wouldn't mind not being invisible. Because Dolly says, I can make this stuff, but what really bothers him is not being able to be really invisible. Yet he can be, we're going to see, perfectly invisible. And I love he listens to this and she says, hmm, it's silly, you know, to worry because you can't do something you simply can't do. That's worse than trying to make yourself by taller by standing on your head. It's silly worrying about something you cannot do. No matter what. In other words, it's like saying, it's silly worrying about the fact that you don't have blue eyes because your eyes are brown. What good does it do to worry about your eyes when there's nothing you can do about it? What good does it do to worry about not having some ability that somebody else has, that they have from birth? Whether it's singing or it's painting or naturally, musically gifted, you know, Little brats like Mozart who sit down at a piano and they start playing when they're two and writing symphonies when they're four. What good does it do to say, I wish I was like that? No, no, no. Yeah, because wishing doesn't make it so. None of these well-intentioned remarks cheered the dwarf who strode angrily ahead. So they're trying to cheer him up, but it doesn't do any good. Okay. Page 151, Fluter tells him, keep at it, old boy. Another try might do it. Your outline looks definitely blurred. In other words, Dolly's trying to make him invisible, and Fluter's saying, that's it, that's it. Keep going, you can do it. That's like telling the three-year-old or the three-foot-tall person, go ahead, try. You can dunk that basketball if only you try hard enough. Okay. So they keep marching. And the next chapter, they find a Gwithane stuck in a bush. It's injured. And Fluter says, 154, it's a stroke of luck the parents aren't about. Those creatures will tear, tear a man to shreds if they're young or in danger. Because Terran approaches the bird. Arlanui, it reminds me of Akron, especially around the eyes on days when she was in a bad temper. Dolly pulls his axe out. He's getting ready to tear. What are you going to do? Going to do? Do you have any other stupid questions? You can't imagine I'd let it sit there, can you? I'm going to chop off its head to begin with. No, it's hurt. Be glad. If it weren't, neither you nor I nor any of us would be standing here. If it weren't hurt, we'd be dead. Taryn, I will not have it killed. It's in pain and it needs help. Okay. These are the things that attacked them earlier. 
But what did Medwin say about Gwythens? That he only feels sorrow for them. He feels sorrow for them because Taryn said, I don't feel any sorry for them. He said, Aran did what? He twisted the birds to become these things. Arlanri, that's true. It doesn't look comfortable at all. For the matter of that, it looks even worse than Akron. She seems to be implying that she has some pity for Akron. Okay? The dwarf. If I can't make myself invisible, at least I'm no fool. Go ahead. Go ahead. Pick up the vicious little thing. Give it a drink. Pat, pat its head. And then you'll see what happens. In other words, you're going to lose your fingers, kid. Fluter. That's true. I don't enjoy chopping things up. The bird is interesting in a disagreeable sort of way. But, you know, Taryn, Medwin would not say so. That is, overdoing it. In the hills, he spoke of kindness for all creatures, and he told me much about the Gwythaints. I think it's important to bring this one to Kier Dapple. No one has ever captured a live Gwythaint, as far as I know. Who can tell what value it may have? Notice what Taryn is thinking. The bird might become what? Or might be what? Valuable. Valuable. Useful. Like a spy. In other words, maybe we could find a way to interrogate it. It might be able to tell us something. Fluter. Well, okay. If it has any use at all, it would be better alive than dead. But it's risky. Terrence says... If I can find the right herbs, I'll make a poultice, that is, a salve to put on its wounds. He says, we need to make a cage for it. So they make a cage. And Dolly says, 157, if you expect me to build a cage, you're mistaken. Terry, good idea. Just what we need. I'll make one myself. And Taryn tries. And Dolly finally says, stop. Taryn's not a maker. Right? He can't do that. So, what does Dolly do? Make Makes it. it himself. Page 159. They put it in the cage. They give it food and water. They go to sleep that night, and the next morning, the bird's gone. He says, Dolly says, told you. Didn't say I don't warn you. Don't say I didn't warn you. It's probably halfway to Anuvan, and it's going to tell Aran. Terran could not hide his disappointment or fear. This is page 159. Fluter says nothing. Terran, I've done the wrong thing again, as usual. How's the, the novel start? Him wanting to make a sword and then watching it. Okay. He can't make a sword. He can't make horseshoes. He can't keep watch on the pig. It escapes. He can't keep an eye on Gwydion. He's captured, now dead, he thinks. Everything he does is a failure. Dolly is right. There's no difference between a fool and an assistant pig keeper. Arlonry, probably true, but I can't stand people who say, I told you so. Dolly means well, she says. He's not half as disagreeable as he pretends. So, they get overtaken, they think, by the Horn King and his champions, or his riders. And where do I want to pick up? I'm going to pick up with the Flame of Dernwen. Um, they beat off the riders. And they see marching columns of men. Terrence says, I've got to be with Gwydion's people. Um, 168-69. They see the Horn King again. Terran tries to fight him. Arlanwi gets pulled off the horse. And 
they get captured. I'm skipping a bunch. I'm trying to think of let's see where. And uh, da, 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 da. page 175. Terence sees Gwydion. He hears a voice. And Terence stared, bottom of 175. Terence stood up at the, started up at the familiar voice. Gwydion stood in the doorway. He's got a, you know, cloak and such. His shining raiment of a prince. Terence brings forward. Uh, they talk about what happened. And I want to pick up with 178, right? Gwydion has told Terran about the conversation he had with Ocran and such. And how he escaped. And on 178, he says... Um, Talking about the kind of the, the not torture, um, the despair that seeped into him from where he was kept. He said, I withstood it, right in the middle of 178. I withstood it. I withstood it, and at the end, much was revealed to me which before had been clouded. Of this too I shall not speak. It is enough for you to know that I understood the workings of life and death. That is, while he was under Ocran's uh, power. Uh, enough for you to know that I understood the workings of life and death, of laughter and tears, endings and beginnings. I saw the truth of the world and knew no change could hold me. My bonds were light as dreams. At that moment, the walls of my prison melted. In other words, the prison that he had been put in was a prison of his own making, a prison of his own mind, because of the power that Ocran had. What became of Akron? I long yes. I do not know. I did not see her thereafter. For some days I lay concealed in the forest to heal the injuries of my body. Spiral Castle was in ruins when I returned to seek you. Okay. So Akron never had him in Spiral Castle. She had him under a spell of sorts, but he says he withstood the spell. And only by standing against it, by opposing it, he says he learned all this other stuff. So he says, I came, I saw the castle, it was destroyed, there was nobody there. I made, made for care at Dethel. And he said, that day, bottom of 178, I saw Gwythae plunge from the sky and flew directly toward me. To my surprise, it neither attacked nor sped away after it had seen me, but, but fluttered before me, crying strangely. Though Gwythae's language is no longer secret to me, nor is the speech of any living creature. In other words, as a result of his trial at Ocran's hands, he can now speak to all living creatures. And because of what the Guthain cried to him, I understood a band of travelers was journeying from the hills nearby, and a white pig accompanied them. So when the Guthain left Terran, Fluter, Ilanwi, Dolly, and the pig, it found Gwydion. Terran thinks when the Gwythaint leaves, it does what Dolly thinks. Flies straight back to Anuvin. So he says, I hasten to retrace my steps, but then Henwin sensed I was close at hand when she ran from you. She didn't run in terror, she ran to me. Okay. And I understood why Aron's champion sought her just desperately. He too realized she knew the one thing that could destroy him. Terran, what was that? She knew the Horn King... Se Horned King's secret name. Terran. That's it? That's it? Knowing his name? I never realized the name could be so powerful. Gwydion. Yes. This is 179. Once you have courage to look upon evil, seeing it for what it is and naming it by its true name, it is powerless against you and you can destroy it. Why? Because uh, evil holds, or it hides in the unknown, because that's what scares okay. us the most. And once we know what it is, 
we can easily seek it out and root it out and have it gone. How many of you have read the Harry Potter novels? I think some of you have, okay. Why is, at the beginning at least, why is Albus Dumbledore the only one who calls Lord Voldemort Lord Voldemort? Everybody else calls him he who must not be named. Dumbledore doesn't fear him. He tells Harry, always call a thing by what it is. Call it by its name. Fear of a name does what? It's Increases no fear of the thing itself. Okay? President Roosevelt said, back in 1933, all we have to fear, in one of his fireside chats, is fear itself. Okay? So, he says, Henwin told me the name of the Horn King. And Terrence says, um, where's the Gwythaint now? He kind of thinks like it's a pet. Well, it came to you, it told you about us, Gwydion. I don't know. <laughs> I doubt she will ever return to Anuvan, for Iran would rend her to pieces once he learned what she had done. I only know she has repaired, repaid your kindness in the fullest measure. So this poor Gwythaint's going to go off and be all by itself. It's not going to fly in a flock anymore. Ailanwi says, what was the Horn King's name? It must remain a secret, Gwydion says. Okay? So, a few days later than that, or after that, they're at Kiridathel, which is Gwydion's kingdom. And Gwydion is handing out gifts. Page 181. Um, Taryn is brought before the high king. Let's see here. Bottom of 180. Yeah. Uh, top of 181. Gwydion calls to them as they're getting ready to leave to head back to Caradalbin and wherever it is Ailanwi belongs. He says, these are small gifts for great valor. But it is in my power to bestow them. So he gives to Fluter Flam one harp string. Though all his others break, this shall forever hold, regardless of how many gallant extravagances he may put on. And its tone shall be the truest and most beautiful. Now we haven't been told here, I don't think. No, we haven't. But Taliesin, the bard, the chief of the bards lives there, by the way. Okay. And Taliesin gave him the the um, the harp earlier. So Fluter gets a string that will never break. To Dolly the Fair Folk shall be granted the power of invisibility so long as he chooses to retain it. He has it as long as he wants it. To faithful and valiant Gurgi shall be given a wallet of food, which shall always be full. That is, Gurgi will never go hungry, as long as he has that purse. Guard it well, it is one of the treasures of Pradain. To Ailan, we have the house of Lear, shall be given a ring of gold set with a gem carved by the ancient craftsmen of the fair folk. It is precious, but more precious is her friendship to me. And to Taryn of Caradalbin, I don't know what to give you. <laughs> what should I give you, Taryn? I ask no reward. I want no friend to repay me for what I did willingly out of friendship and for my own honor. He says, I did what I did, one for friendship and two for my own honor. <clears throat> okay? I don't need payment. Gwydion. Taryn of Caradalbin, you are still as touchy and headstrong as ever. In other words, shut up. <laughs> Just shut up. Believe that I know what you yearn for in your heart. What does he yearn for? The dreams of heroism, of worth, and of achievement are noble ones. That's what you want. You want to be a hero. You want to do heroic deeds. You want worth 
That is self-worth. What kind of self-worth does Taryn want? I secretly want to find out that I am of noble birth, that I'm royalty, okay? And achievement, you want to perform great deeds. He goes, these are all noble, noble aspirations. But you, not I, must make them come true. That is, you must achieve heroism. You must... How do you earn noble birth? You can't. But what can you do? Become noble yourself. You can become noble. You can have noble worth. And you can achieve. He says, so ask me something else. Can't give you any of these. Tara, in spite of all that has befallen me, I've come to love the valleys and mountains of your northern lands. But my thoughts have turned more and more to care Dalvin. I long to be home. He wants to go back to where he wanted to flee from. He, how long has he spent away? Uh, weeks. Longer than that. Months. Nearly a year. He's been away for a long time. He's had an adventure, right? He's fought the Horned King. He's met the Fair Folk. He's been attacked by wild, crazy birds. He saved one. He met an evil witch. Time to go back to a simpler, easier, boringer life. And he goes home. Swift journey back. And he meets up with Call and Dalvin. And Dalvin says, 184. I should like the two of us to speak quietly to each other, he and Taryn. First, I want to know what you think of being a hero. Come on, tell me. I dare say you feel rather proud of yourself. But your face doesn't tell me that. You would think being a hero, he's walking around all cocky-like. I have no cause for pride. pride. I have no just cause for pride. It was Gwydion who destroyed the Horn King, and Hinwin helped him do it. In other words, I didn't do it. But Gurgi, not I, found her. That is, Gurgi found the pig, not me. Doli and Fluter fought, fought gloriously. While I was wounded by a sword, I had no right to draw. Remember, he attempts to draw Durdwin, and what happens? He burns his hand. Burns his hand and is essentially knocked out by it. And Ilongwi was the one who took the sword from the barrel in the first place. What I did was mostly by mistakes. In other words... I'm just a royal screw-up. These others are the ones who did great things. Dalbin. Wow. Man, talk about a Debbie Downer. <laughs> it was you who held the companions together and led them. Okay. It was Alonwi who rescued him and Fluter. But it was him who kept them and then Gurgi together. And then Doli. You did what you set out to do, which was what? Rescue Henwin. Rescue Henwin. And Henwin is safely back with us. If you made mistakes, you recognize them. And what do you do when you recognize something? You learn from it. As I told you, there are times, back at the beginning, when the seeking counts more than the finding. He set out to find Henwin. No, it's the seeking of Henwin that resulted in Taryn learning all these important lessons. Dalbin, does it truly matter which of you did what? Since all shared the same goal and the same danger. I mean, this is what set, I'll use a real world example couple years, no, it was longer than that, four or five years, I think, after it happened, four or five years after SEAL Team 6 took out Osama bin Laden, 
The actual operator, that's what they call him, the actual operator, the member of SEAL Team 6, he says, who put the two slugs in his head, took credit for it. Publicly. Was named. Okay? That goes against the whole SEAL culture. He was out of SEAL Team 6 by that point. Okay? T totally violates their whole culture. Because a SEAL team essentially says, we all did it. <laughs> we were all on the choppers. We all went into the building. We all rounded up people. It was totally what? Team effort. Okay. Quarterback can't do what quarterbacks do without a team. <laughs> front line, without everybody else. He can't throw it to somebody because unless he's you know Superman, <laughs> he can't make a pass and catch it at the same time. Okay. Nothing we do is ever done entirely alone. Dalton says there is a part of us and everyone else. You of all people should know that. From what I hear, you have been as as impetuous as your friend Fluter. When Fluter flies off with some comment, right? That's his impetuousness. I've been told, among other things, of a night when you dove headfirst into a thorn bush. Yeah, that was really smart. But why did he do it? Because he thought Gwydion was... He's going to save Gwydion. And you have certainly felt as sorry for yourself as Gurgi, and like Dolly, striven for the impossible. I think I can. I think I can. I think I can make myself invisible. Taryn, yeah, that's not what troubles me. I have dreamed often of Kara Dalbin, and I love it. And you and Call, more than ever, that is, since I left, I have dreamed often of all this. I asked for nothing better than to be at home. This is what I wanted when, when Gwydion offered me something. And yet my heart rejoices. But, you know, I've returned to the chamber I slept in, and it's smaller than I remember. Is that just because... He has grown a few inches? No. No. The fields are beautiful, but they are not the same. And I am troubled, for I wonder now if I am to be a stranger in my own home. Essentially, what has happened to Terran? Okay, but before then. He went off to war. He went off and fought in some battles. And he came back changed. He's not the stupid kid that he was when he left. He's still stupid. He's just not as stupid. Dalvin, no, of course not. That you shall never be, that is, the stranger in my own home. But it is not Kara Dalvin which has grown smaller. You have grown bigger. Physically... Mentally. Why? Yes? Well, I was going to ask something that was referring to the last thing. You said it's because of the war. I understand war changes you, but do you think it has anything to do with the fact that you realized that he took advantage for granted what he did have? Yes. Yeah, he took it entirely for granted. Because notice, while, he, while he's there at the beginning of the novel, what does he dream of? Leaving. Doing great things. While he's off, while he's left... And doing great things, he doesn't think they're great, by the way. The, the, the saving of the Gwithaint in here, I'll give a little hint away. It comes back at the most important point in the last book. That little act of mercy that he shows to this demon bird comes back to save. Here, at the most important point in the fifth and final book. Okay? Taryn, and there's there's Ilandri. What what will become of her? I mean, it, it, can she stay with us? Now, do you think he still thinks of her as just a stupid little girl? Nope. Mm, no, there's a little more going on there. Dalbin, she should be returned to her kinsman. Yes, she's a princess. She's a princess. Taryn's what? 
Nobody. Nobody. <laughs> do nobodies ever get to marry princesses? No. Nope. Well, in Japan they do because the princess, daughter of the king or whatever they have, emperor I guess, is giving up her royal station to marry a commoner. Did Prince William give up his royal station so he could marry Kate Middleton? Nope. Nope. Elevates her. <laughs> Nice thing of being you know, royalty. If you're royalty, you're whoever you want to be royalty, they can become royalty. Okay? She might consent to stay. Maybe if you spoke to her, Karen, yeah, I will. He tells her, and she says, Okay. I suppose it never occurred to you to ask me if I wanted to? He says, Well, I didn't think. No, you usually don't. Alanu says. Call us. Straightening up a place for me already? How did he know? How did you know? That is, how did Call know that I would ask Dalvin? How did you know? What's that tell us? She's clairvoyant. Is it clear is that she's clairvoyant? She can see the future? She's predictable. Or is it just that she's got a head on her shoulders and Taryn's really dense? Okay. Taryn is really dense. Turn to the Black Cauldron. Hopefully you brought it. A few more minutes. Look at the author's note. He says in the second paragraph, If a darker thread runs through the high spirits, that is, of this novel, that is, its tone starts to get a little darker, it's because the happenings are of serious import not only to the land of Pridane, but to Terran, the assistant pig keeper himself. Although an imaginary world, Pridane is essentially not too different from our real one, where humor and heartbreak, joy and sadness are closely interwoven. And I think he's partially saying the humor and heartbreak, the joy and sadness, are central to the story, not as much finding a large magical iron cauldron. We don't have those in our real world. The choices and decisions that face a frequently baffled assistant pig keeper are no easier than the ones we ourselves must make. Even in a fantasy realm, growing up is accomplished not without cost. In other words, not without cost means what? That you will lose a part of yeah, you got to lose some things in order to grow up. He doesn't mean simply growing up age-wise. But maturing means losing some things. Okay? So we find out, chapter 1, for Taryn, the summer was ending before it had begun. That morning, Dalvin had given him the task of washing the oracular pig. Had the old enchanter ordered him to capture a full-grown full Gwythaint, Tyrion would gladly have set out after one of the vicious-winged creatures. As it was, he filled the bucket at the well and trudged reluctantly to Henwyn's enclosure. What's he thinking? I can do more than this. I can do more than just wash the damn pig. If he wants me to, I'll go after a full... What does that mean? Yeah, it's a suicide task to go capture a full-grown Gwythant. He's saying, if he asked me to, I'd jump down a dragon's throat. But no, I'll wash the pig. Okay, And a rider comes up, a few years older. You there, pig boy. Taryn looks at him, threadbare clothes, that is, they're well-worn, but the cloak is mended and such. You, pig boy, is this Kerr Dalbin? It is, but I'm not a pig boy. I'm Karen, this is the pig keeper. Ooh, a title. A pig is a pig, and a pig boy <laughs> is a pig boy. Run and tell your master I am here. Tell him that Prince Eladir, son of Pinhlarkow, is here. 
and the pig rolls into another puddle. Okay. He's got the pig clean, and it rolls in a puddle of mud. <coughs> and he starts to wash the pig again. Leave off with that. Did you not hear me? Do as I say and be quick about it. Tell Dalbin yourself, or wait until I've done with my own work. Mind your impudence, or you shall have a good beating for it. Not by you, Tyranny essentially says. <coughs> and what happens? He gets beaten up. He gets picked up by the jacket and thrown against the barn wall. Okay? Which brings Dalvin and Call out of doors. And this Prince El Eladir says, I brought your pig boy to be thrashed for insolence. Dalvin. Whether he's insolent is one thing. Whether he should be thrashed is another. I don't need any suggestions from you. I am a prince of Pinlarkel. Woohoo! Essentially. Dalvin, yes, yes, yes. In other words, of course you are. I am quite aware of all that, too busy to be concerned with it. In other words, your name means nothing to me. Your title means nothing to me. Water your horse and your temper at the same time. You shall be called when you are wanted. In other words, oh great and mighty prince, when I need you, I'll send my pig boy for you, and he will call you. He doesn't use those exact words, but that's the import of what he's saying. I don't want you right now. Go away. Meanwhile, Call says, you should know better. Arlan me, especially if they're on horseback and you're on foot. How good are you going to fight a guy on horseback? Tear it away next time. Next time he's going to. Dalvin, when you meet again, you at least shall conduct yourself with as much restraint and dignity as possible, which I know is not very great, but. Okay. So already, first couple pages of the book, Taryn's starting to learn a few lessons again. Why must he learn so many lessons? Because he has so much to learn. Okay, because he has so much to learn. Because he's young. He's inexperienced. Even though, I know, he went off on a great adventure in the previous book. I was just like, does he tell me, like, all of us, when we grow up, does he tell me, like, don't touch, you know, your mom's just got to touch the oven. You're going to touch it, then you get burned, and then you learn your lesson. He's headstrong. Name a, I don't remember how old, I think he is actually, we're told, the exact age. He's like 13 or 14. Name a 13 or 14 year old who doesn't think they know everything. Okay? So, they're talking back and forth, Taryn and Ilan Wien said. Gwydion shows up, and he tells Taryn, he tells Ilan Wien, you're looking prettier than ever. And he says to Taryn, and you, assistant pig keeper, look a little worse for the wear. Dalvin told me how you came by those bruises. I sought no quarrel. But one found you nonetheless. What's he mean? Yeah, but you have a habit, like Harry Potter, of finding yourself in trouble, Taryn. Why do you think that is? You know, think for a moment. I think that must be the way of it with you, Taryn of Kara Dalvin. Says, I would hoped, I hope you have gained as much wisdom as weight. Taryn's thickened out a little bit. He says, now i got to go to the council. Okay? Taryn, I'm old enough to sit in the council of men. I haven't learned much. I fought at your side. I have... Gently, gently. Though manhood may not be all that you believe. In other words, being a man isn't just about fighting. Don't worry. Just... Stay ready. Your task will be given. Fluter shows up. And with Fluter, bottom of page 11, a guy named Adeon, who is the son of the chief bard Taliesin. And Fluter's like, wow, Kara Dalbin is really honored today. In other words, having Gwydion there isn't quite enough. But having Adeon, that's something. And Taryn looks at him and he notices. He's tall, straight black hair. Though noble bearing, he wore the garb of an ordinary warrior. In other words, 
Adion doesn't have to put on a show for people. He's got a brooch in his collar. His eyes are gray, deep. And Adion says, well met. Taryn of Caradalbin and Dolly of the Fair Folk, who also shows up. Your names are not unknown among the bards of the north. What does he mean? How do the bards of the north know Taryn's and Dolly's names? They sing of their uh, time against the They're king. singing of their exploits against the horned king. In other words, songs are sung, like novels, about Taryn of Caradalbin. Now... Isn't that an indicator that Taryn has earned some reputation, some honor among others? Taryn, then you're a bard too? What did Fluter just tell him? He's the son of the chief bard. You think he's not going to be a bard also? Adion, my father has asked me to sit the rights for initiation, but I'm going to wait. Okay. Fluter starts to say something, and he points out, you know, the broken strings in his heart. Adion, be of good cheer. This is the bottom of page 12. Your gallant tales are worth all the harp strings in Perdane. And you, Taryn and Dolly, was promised to tell me more of your famous deeds. Now that's got to make you feel pretty good to hear something like that. Taryn, and our names are indeed known to him, and there have been songs about us. And yet I can't go sit in the council, is what he's thinking. Okay? So, we see the council, and Taryn is invited to it. And we see King Smoit is there, and Morgant is there, a whole bunch of people. Page 15. Dalvin then starts it. It says, little more than a year ago, some of you remember, Aran, Lord of Anuvin, suffered grave defeat when the Horn King was slain. But, e but in Predane, evil is never distant. Okay. He goes on, he says, I hope we'd have a little more time for peace. But that's not the case. So Gwydion's going to speak now. And Gwydion talks about the cauldron. He says, we've got to get it. We've got to take the cauldron from Aram. Why? Because he just keeps building up this army. We have to take the cauldron. It's got to be destroyed. And he finishes by saying, bottom of page 16, I need your help. I ask your help for a mean to attack Anuvin itself to seize Aram's cauldron and destroy it. Okay, what does that mean? I'm going to march into hell. And I need some warriors to come along with me. Taryn jumps up. Gwydion says, it's the only way this can be done. So page 19, they come up with a plan that not everybody likes. Okay? And here's the plan. Page 19, bottom of the page. At Dark Gate, we shall divide into three bands. Dark Gate's the entrance to the kingdom, not to the palace of Ron. The first shall number Dolly the Fair Folk, Kal, son of Kalfur, Fluter Flam, son of Godo, and myself. With us will be six of King Morgan's strongest and most valiant warriors. Dolly, being invisible, will sneak in. Um, sorry, this is at the palace itself. We'll breach the portal and seize the cauldron. Okay. At the same time, on my signal, the second band of King Morgant and his horsemen will attack Dark Gate, seemingly in great strength. Okay? So confusion, it's a diversionary tactic. Draw attention away from us while we're stealing the cauldron. All right. And the third band, bottom of page 20, he says, will await us near Dark Gate to guard our pack animals, secure our retreat, and to serve as the need demands. So the third group, what can they look forward to? Being the pack animals? Yeah, nothing, really. Guard the animals, 
and be there in case we need to make a quick escape. That will be Adion, son of Taliesin, Taryn of Caradalbin, and Eladir, son of Pinlarkal. Notice, Adion, son of Taliesin, greatest part there ever is, or was, or will be, and Eladir, son of Pinlarkal, son of a king, prince, and Taryn, son of... Oh, that's right, we don't know. So we just call him Taryn of this little shit sty, you know, out in the middle of nowhere. Eladir, why am I being held back? Am I no better than a pig boy? He has untried a green apple. Terran, I have stood against the cauldron board with Gwydion himself. Have you been better tried? He doesn't stop there. Prince Patch Cloak? Why the Prince Patch Cloak? Because his cloak is all patched. Because his cloak is patched. But what does he mean by it? Thanks and significance. You're dirt poor. You can't even afford a proper cloak. Eladir's hand flies to his sword. Gwydion says, shut it, all of you. Eladir, curb your temper, leave this council. You, Gwydion says to Terran, you have repaid anger with a childish insult. I had thought better of you. Now, both of you have to obey Adion. <laughs> He's in charge. Eladir. Bottom of that page. I am a king's son. Whose son are you? He says to Terran. Because Terran tries to make up. So you have stood against the cauldron born. And with Gwydion. You lost no chance to make that known. Terran, you boast of your name. I take pride in my comrades. My comrades. We fought together. You know, arm in arm. Not really, but... Terran's going to embellish a little bit. Your friendship with Gwydion is no shield to me. In other words, it's not going to protect you, boy. All right? Terran says, middle of the next page, talking with Dalvin, when Dalvin kind of reprimands him a little, Terran says, Eladir spoke the truth. Whose son am I? I have no name but the one you gave me. Eladir is a prince. He doesn't get a finish because Dalbin cuts him off. Prince he may be, yet perhaps not so fortunate as you. In other words, yeah, he has the title prince. What does it matter if that's all you have? See, prince usually has what behind it? Titles. No? Respect. Why respect? Because they People are supposed to respect princes. He's going to be the heir to the throne. Heir to the throne. You know, Prince Charles, for example. Queen Elizabeth's the queen. So what does he have behind that prince part? One, he's next in line to the throne. Okay, so big deal. Because to be king of England today really means what? Diddly squad, right? Other than, you had your hand up? Money. Money! What goes with being monarchy in England? Buku bucks, man. <laughs> Tons of castles, an art collection to die for, planes, trains, automobiles, literally planes, trains, and automobiles, golden coach, literal golden coach. I've seen it with my own two eyes. The thing's made out of solid gold. Literally. <laughs> okay. Power? Can he lead armies to war? No, not really. Okay. But he's got all the trappings of royalty. What does Eladir have? Well, listen to Dalbin. He is the youngest son of old Pin Larkow in the northern lands. Youngest son means what? You don't get anything. Last in line. His elder brothers have inherited what little there was of family fortune. And even that is gone. He gets diddly squat. Eladir has only his name and his sword. Though I admit he uses them both with something less than wisdom. He could use, he could use them. He could use them wisely. He could use them to draw people to him and instead 
He uses them as a cudgel to beat people away. But these things have a way of writing themselves. In other words, karma, man, it's a bitch. <laughs> it's going to come back to him. Page 23. Dalvin gives Taryn a sword. Finally, he has a real sword. He bows low and says, um, what are its powers? Where's the magic switch? What turns it into a lightsaber, so to speak? Tell me now, Dalvin, its powers? Uh, it's a bit of metal hammered, hammered into a rather unattractive shape. I mean, what is its shape useful for? Is it good for digging? For growing plants? Is it good for, you know, Making irrigation? No, it's pretty much good for one thing. Is it even good for hammering? No, not really. It could better have been a pruning hook or a plow iron. Why better? You prune plants to do what? So they could grow. It's not just so they could grow. Why do you prune a fruit tree? It's to make it produce more fruit. A plow iron? To plow the ground, to plant seed, to grow crops. Its powers? Like all weapons, only those held by him who wields it. It'll be only as powerful as the person who holds it. What yours are? I don't know. <laughs> okay. So they go off. The next morning, Taryn says goodbye to Ilan Wee. And we, we're going to stop there because I don't want to do with, deal with this part with Adeon yet. Um, so, for Tuesday, we might finish this. Pretty good chance we'll finish it. So if we have a quiz, it'll be over the whole book.